Hello Church, thank you for joining me today. As you can tell, we're not uh, back together yet in person. A uh, couple things about that. Our facilities have been upgraded. We now have one network across the entire campus, which will enable us to uh, broadcast video to virtually any building where we can spread out. So we have met, leaders and I, we have made you know, several observations, written those down. Uh, when we do come back together, it's going to be a little different, as you might know, and we will probably do a video at that point. But the, the leaders now also, the other leaders now also want you to know something. When we do come back together, and honestly, we're not going to try until after the fourth. Uh, if if then we're, we're trying to we're trying to watch and observe what's happening. Uh, I was reading an article this morning. Three of the four fastest growing uh, areas for new infections are in North and South Carolina. I'm not sure why that is. I have a sneaking suspicion it might be church activity. I don't know that. I don't know that, but but I think we've met probably a little early in some cases and done some things that maybe we wish we hadn't. Nonetheless, I trust that you're safe. And um, after observing and watching what's going on and and noting the fourth holiday this coming week, we 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 feel like any opening date is going to be after that. But when we do come back to open, you need to understand that this is going to be a fluid situation. We do not know what the authorities are going to say. We do not know what the infection rates are going to be. Uh, I wish things were more settled, but they're not. It could be that we meet a week or two, and then we don't meet a week or two. We, we don't know. We don't know. So we ask for your patience and love. And again, if any of you are getting frustrated, I encourage you to think of your brothers and sisters in Christ. And, and if you're at home, you need to be worshiping at home. I trust you're watching these sermons and these encouragement videos with your families. And I trust that, uh, that you're being encouraged and helped by this. Uh, to be honest with you, uh, there are many, many ways I think I have grown spiritually during these days. So I trust God is doing that in your life, and if, if it hasn't happened yet, you need to take the steps to try to, to see that that happens. So I'm praying for you. I trust you're praying for me. We still have some folks who need our prayers in our church family. Really, that prayer list I gave you a couple of weeks ago hasn't changed. We need to still remember them. I hope that all of you saw the graduate video this week. If you haven't, make sure you check that out on our Facebook page. Uh, or our YouTube channel. So uh, please do that. And again, congratulations to all of our graduates. So here now is part three of the sermon, The Long Road Back. We've looked at David's failure. We've, all, we've, we've now, for the past couple of weeks, looked at uh, the aftermath of his failure, what it cost him, how it came about, and, and what it was that, that God did in his life and what God pronounced through the prophet Nathan. These are some heavy things, and they remind us of our accountability toward God, that he takes our personal lives, our personal sin, very seriously. So we need to remember that he is a holy and righteous God. He's a loving, patient father, but he's also a holy, righteous God. So join me now, 2 Samuel chapter 12, as we look at part three of The Long Road Back. Here we are back in 2 Samuel chapter 12, for the third part of this message on David's long road back, a theology of repentance, grace, and consequences. In the subtitle there, you have the three areas that of, of David's experience we are looking at. And so I want to remind you that first of all we talked about we talked about David's repentance and it, it was a true repentance. A lot of things we can learn from that. 
It started with a word from God. God did a work in his heart bringing about this repentance in David's life. Then we talked about the forgiveness and grace that David received. And it was a a, a pardon. It was a, a distribution of grace in his life because David, through the prophet Nathan, uh, learned that God would not take his life. But today we're going to be looking at another aspect of of this episode, and, and that is the consequences that that David uh, experienced. Uh, we we don't have a hard time agreeing on repentance and grace, at least for the most part. I think most of you agreed with what I said and and how we brought application in that regard. Yet when it comes to this idea of consequences. All of us are not always in agreement. Often we are at odds. Does God bring consequences in the lives of his children? Sometimes we think of those consequences as us having to pay for our sins. But that is is the furthest thing from the truth. They are not payment for sin. And what we believe about the consequences of sin often will reveal what we believe about God. Uh, it also reveals our own sense of self-righteousness in many ways. So as we look at this, I want to be careful. Never emotionally manipulative. That is never my intention, not what I want to do today. But instead, I want to find the truth in this story. I want to learn something else about God. I want to learn something about myself when compared to God. I want to learn about his character, who he is, what he is concerned about, and and why those consequences come into my life. So let's examine three truths that are found, I think, in these verses, um, in verses 7 through 14. Not going to take the time to read all that we've already read, but let's just begin as we look first at this truth about the character of God. So let me read uh, two verses here. First of all, in verse number 13, And David said unto Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. There's his repentance. And here is is Nathan's response. And there are two things you you need to hear in this response. And Nathan said unto David, The Lord also hath put away your sin. You shall not die. So that is an awesome statement of grace, isn't it? That reveals, first of all, that he is judged. Now, you probably have a negative picture of judgment in your mind at this point, but that's, when I say judge, I'm not being negative. A judge can be positive or negative. It depends on his pronouncement. In this case, the judge of the universe is positive. He has said, I will not, uh, I will not kill you. You will not die. I have put away your sin. And the second thing he says there is that how be it uh, he continues there in uh, in in verse uh, number 14 i believe it is he said you shall not die how be it because by this deed you have given great occasion to the enemies of the lord to blaspheme the child also that is born unto you shall surely die now when you read that you are reminded that not only is he judge able to pronounce judgment or to remove judgment, but secondly, that he's also ruler. Let me me go back for a second to the fact of his being judged. We we need to always remember upon what basis God grants pardon. It's never upon some arbitrary feeling or some goodwill that he just wants to do it because he's in a good mood one day. As judge, he is able to offer pardon in this case, as well as in our case, upon one thing, and that's based upon the finished work of Christ. In this case, and we'll talk about it in a second, um, well, we'll talk about it now. His, his pardon is based on the work of Christ anticipating what his son would do. Jesus had not died yet. Jesus had not borne our sins yet, but here he is pardoning David. I have put away your sin. How is it that he does that? He is anticipating the work of his son. In the same way, he puts away our sin. 
and tells us that and and tells us we don't have to experience eternal death because of the finished work of Christ uh, based on that which is past that which is completed so he alone is judged and he pardons based upon the work of his son but there's also something else here in these verses not only is he the judge able to pardon or to or to sentence but secondly he's also ruler howbeit the child that is born to you will surely die wait a minute wait a minute wait a minute i thought you said that his grace removes our sin it does it does and you say i thought i thought being forgiven meant that i'm scot free i'm free from everything no there are ways in which our sins and i believe even sin enacted before we come to christ because of human relationships because of the very nature of the sin curse upon this world there are consequences those are not judgments of god that he heaps upon men when they after they repent no those are consequences that our sin has brought about and you ask again but i thought god's forgiveness meant i'm free you are free i am free and just as in David's case, we don't have to die. And how quickly we assume that God has laid aside his holiness and righteousness. And such holiness that requires him to take notice of David's wickedness as the ruler of the universe. Noticing the wickedness in the life of the ruler of Israel. He, and, and, and we're, we're quick to put aside the notion that God would act in a man or a woman's life to demonstrate, to show that no man can sin without impunity. We read verses like this, Psalm 103.10, what a blessed verse it is. He hath not dealt with us after our sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. The truth about that, again, is based upon the finished work of Christ. He has not dealt with us after our sin, but we need to remember he has dealt with sin. It's been punished. He's righteous. No sin, no sin goes unpunished. The only reason he's not dealt with us is that he's dealt with our sin in the life of another. And this verse is so true because each of us deserved, deserved to die an eternal death in hell. God has not dealt with us after our sin, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. If he did, we would all be in hell. Yet that wonderful verse, as awesome and freeing and liberating as it is, does not mean that God ignores our disobedience. In fact, I would argue that the verse above deals primarily with eternal consequences. He has not dealt with us eternally according to our sin, meaning he has not sentenced us to hell. But let me remind all of us that God is still, still the moral ruler of this universe, and he will deal with us governmentally according to his will. God is able to give us evidence of his hatred of sin in any way he desires to give it. Sometimes we have to be reminded of that. Others have to be reminded of that in our own lives. We may be forgiven, but that does not mean that the righteousness of God has been nullified. Now, I do believe that I can say that because this episode also teaches us, secondly, truth about the concern of of God. You look in verses 7 through 9 and and something becomes pretty clear. Let me go back and read these for you in 2 Samuel chapter 12. Nathan said to David, you're the man. Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, I anointed you king over Israel and I delivered you out of the hand of Saul. I gave you your master's house and your master's wives into your bosom and gave you the house of Israel and of Judah 
And if that had been too little, I would moreover have given unto thee other such things. Wherefore, and why have you despised the commandment of the Lord to do evil in his sight? Then let me skip ahead to the first part of verse 14 and listen to what uh, Nathan says to him here. Howbeit, he said, because by this deed thou hast given great occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme. Therefore, the child also that is born unto you shall surely die. What do you hear in those verses? Well, what I hear is God speaking, God speaking concerning his concern about himself. Now, I don't mean in a selfish way. God is incapable of being sinfully selfish. But God is concerned about himself, meaning he is concerned about his glory. How does David's sin make him look? How does it reflect on his character that we've just talked about, his perfect, righteous holiness? Now, when you look at sin that way, even sin of the life of a believer, which is what you have here in the life of David, that ought to change the way that every single one of us looks at disobedience and at sin. It's not our life that matters. It's not our rights that matter. It's not what's best for us that matters. It's God. And what's best for God that matters, period. It's his glory. It's his honor. Now, in this case, God pronounces a very troubling, serious thing. He says that the baby which is conceived in your sin has to die. That's a hard thing for me to understand. Now, the only way I can process that is that the sin which David had committed had brought such shame to God's name that the tangible, visible fruit, even that being the life of a little, innocent child, one who had never as of yet committed sin, one who would be born a sinner but as of yet had not committed sin, could not be allowed to live because he would call attention to or in other in some other way seem to condone the sin that had happened. Now it's hard for us to rationalize or justify this innocent life not being allowed to live. But again, I draw you back to what I just said. We're not talking about the importance of David's life. We're not talking about the importance of Bathsheba's life. I'm not even talking about the innocence or the importance of the baby's life. And my goodness, how the lives of children are so important. Don't get me wrong. But what we're talking about is the importance of God's glory. The importance of God's name. The importance of God's honor. Frankly, that is the most important priority in the universe. So think about consequences that God might bring into your life. He might bring into my life. The reason those consequences might come into the lives of professing, proclaiming Christians, Christians who have have been in church all their lives, and, and how dare anyone say, why would God let this happen to me? I made one mistake. I have lived for him all of my life. Well, think about what you're saying. The fact that you have lived for him all of your life, The fact that he's claimed you for his own. The fact that you have served him and you have a testimony makes the failure, whatever that might be, that much more damaging to the honor and glory of God. I've often thought about pastors, and I've said this in the pulpit. And my goodness, when I talk about this, I always get a little shaky because I I don't want to draw attention to myself or frankly even talk about it. But I've often thought, If the day would come when I would fail, if I would fail in a way that would disqualify me for the ministry, what right would I actually have to try to be restored to a place of ministry if my failure brings great dishonor and besmirches the name of Christ, the name of his church, and the honor of this holy God that we serve? 
Now, God forbid that that would ever happen to you or to me, and I trust that it will not. But if, we're, if we are speaking hypothetically, the more that our sin brings shame to God's name, I do believe that the greater and more harsh and more severe the consequences could be. And again, it's not that God is punishing anyone. God's not punishing anyone. God is preserving his honor. That's exactly what he's doing right here in the life of David. If you think about it, in the same way, the same thing happened to Moses. Moses was ready. He was on the cusp of leading the children of Israel into the promised land. And yet, at the last minute, at the last minute, Moses disobeys God in a fit of rage and beats a rock, hits a rock with his staff that God had told him to speak to. Well, Moses showed himself in a couple different ways, but the worst thing he did is that he showed himself disobedient in the eyes of the people. A people who were very, uh, very fickle and who could be turned by any means that man could bring up, easily turned, influenced. He disobeys God in front of everybody. What's the consequence? Was that a punishment of Moses? No. I think you could say discipline, but in, in many more ways it was also a protection of God's honor. He would not have it be seen that a man can disobey God and experience success. So what happened? Moses had to die in the wilderness. Moses had to die on the wrong side of Jordan. It wasn't about Moses paying for his sin. It was about God protecting his honor and his glory. So I think there's a truth here about the concern of God, his concern for his own honor and glory. But number three, going back to the very theme of this last part of this message, I think there's great truth here about the consequences from God, basically what we're talking about. Let me read to you verses 9 through 12. Wherefore has, has, has God, or have, have you, why have you despised the commandment of the Lord to do evil in his sight? You have killed Uriah the Hittite with a sword. You have taken his wife to be your wife. And you have slain him with the sword of the children of Ammon. Now therefore the sword shall never depart from your house, because thou hast despised me, and you've taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. Thus says the Lord, Behold, I will raise up evil against you out of your own house. I will take your wives before your eyes and give them unto your neighbor. He shall lie with your wives in the sight of the sun. For what you did, or you did all these things secretly, but I will do this thing before all Israel and before the sun. There again, I think if you listen, if you see what is being said, you have a God who is protecting his honor. And so the consequences that we see here, all that, all that follows this point, uh, leads us to the truth that a man or a woman, as Galatians chapter 6, verses 7 and 8 tell us, will truly reap what they sow. This is God acting in governmental righteousness. Now think about how this is played out. He says, since you have killed Uriah the Hittite by the sword, you've, you've taken him into the battle against uh, the Ammonites, you've, you've put him in a place where the Ammonite sword would kill him, therefore the sword will never leave your house. Oh, and by the way, you have taken his wife to be your wife. You've done it in a way that's dishonored me, so therefore uh, your wives will be taken from you and will be defiled in your own sight. They will be with another man that came to pass in the life and the rebellion of Absalom. And then thirdly, he says something inter interesting. You have sinned in secret. But in order to protect my honor, I will act in public. Now, God's being consistent here. Uh, there's no doubt about that. He's being very consistent. 
And so when you think about how you see this in other places in Scripture, Arthur Pink brings up some examples. First of all, he says Jacob deceived his own his father, Isaac, with a young goat's skin. And so later on, you see him deceived by the skin, or the, uh, the coat, rather, of his son Joseph dipped in the blood of a goat. Interesting. Think about Pharaoh. He had all the young males drowned in the Nile. That family uh, did that, and, and Pharaoh himself did it. And then later, you see Pharaoh, along with his army, being drowned in the Red Sea. Later, as they enter into the land of Canaan, there are two men by the name of Nadab and Abihu, who take it upon themselves to offer incense and, and to offer sacrifice in an uncondoned way. The Bible calls it strange fire. They offered that unto the Lord. And how does God respond? Immediately, not by just allowing them to drop dead. They offered strange fire. So God sent down fire and consumed them from heaven. On and on it goes. Other places in Scripture we can find where God always applies consequences relative to the sin. Again, what is God saying? God is saying, you cannot disobey me as my child. You cannot do that and be undisciplined. You cannot live as a sinner and claim to be a Christian. You will be chastened. And if you're not chastened, as the book of Hebrews said, then you're not a real child. God doesn't whip the neighbor's kid but he disciplines his own. And so uh, let me say, we need to be warned by this, but I want to take you to that verse as we close today, these several verses. I want to read them for you here. I have them for you on the screen. Galatians 6, verses 7 through 10, be not deceived. Now think of David's life as you read this. God is not mocked. Hmm. I think we've seen that proven and borne out here in the life of David. God is not mocked. You can't kill another man and not experience hardship because of it in your life. You can't commit adultery and experience no bitter fruit of that act. You make that mistake knowing that God has said don't do it. If you belong to me, it will cost you. God is not mocked, for whatsoever man sows, that shall he also reap. Now, we always, always tend to lean heavily on this next part. For he that sows to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. That's what David has done, isn't it? It's exactly what's happened. David has reaped of the flesh corruption, and he's going to until the day he dies. His sons are going to fight. He's never going to experience peace like he did uh, before this. He's going to experience one conflict after the other. Death. The, the, the reaping of corruption in his flesh because he sowed the flesh. So we always, we always emphasize that, but very seldom do we emphasize this. But he that sows to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. And then Paul says, So because of this, let us not be weary in well-doing. For in due season, when the time is right, when God wills it, we shall reap if we faint not. If we endure, he say, As we therefore have opportunity, let us do good to all men. That's sowing to the Spirit, especially unto them who are of the household of faith. That is, your church. And so those verses present a dire, dire warning. And I, again, I'm not one to use that as an emotional manipulation. I have listened to preachers in the past who have threatened people with God killing their kids and, you know, God killing them before they get home. And the, the truth is, God can do that if He wants to. But we're not God and we don't know if He will or not. We don't know that. And I don't use emotional um, 
and, and emotionalism and fear as manipulation. I'm not going to do it. The Word of God has all the power that it needs without my feeble attempt to make it uh, effective. But on the other hand, I haven't heard as often as I think we need to hear the encouragement to sow to the Spirit. David could have sown to the Spirit at that point. And by the way, sowing to the Spirit prevents sowing to the flesh. That's why I encouraged you at the beginning of this video that you grow spiritually during these days. If you have just taken it easy and taken it off, you have not progressed spiritually. You've sown to the flesh, perhaps. If you've sown the flesh, you will of the flesh reap corruption. You will be behind. You are behind. You have backed up. But what a wonderful thing for us to sow to the Spirit and see what God does in our life in that regard. So even beside this dire warning about the consequences of our sin lies the promise that there are also consequences, good consequences, of a righteous and holy life. And if you think about it, that's, that's God's grace. Again, this is not God getting even. It's not God punishing. Don't ever, 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 ever tell another Christian God's going to get you for that. God has already gotten his son, punished his son on your behalf and mine. God's never going to punish me again. But my sin can and will weave a web of consequences that perhaps I might have to live with the rest of my life. Oh, that God would give us grace to see that there are consequences to disobedience and that we not sow to the flesh, but that we sow to the Spirit. I pray that it be such in my life. I pray that it be such in your life. And I pray that God works that in your life, giving you encouragement to sow to the Spirit of God so that spiritual things can be reaped. God bless you, friends. I love you. Well, there you have it. Thank you again for being here. I know that those are some heavy, heavy things we talked about. And I confess, I don't have the answer to all of them. I have never tried to be manipulative and bring fear into people's lives by threatening God's judgment. God's judgment is His way. God's consequences are pronounced and they're brought about in His way. But they're always brought about in a way to honor Himself. And, and if you don't get anything else from this today, take this with you. Consider, uh, meditate on the holiness of God and how that makes Him different from us and how that sets Him apart from us and how that, that, that puts Him on a different level in a way to honor himself. Now, if we honor ourselves, it's pride. If we seek our own glory, it's pride. But for God, it's not. He, he is the only being of the universe who is worthy. So um, think about those things as you live your life and as you arrange your priorities and you seek to honor him, both as individuals and as a church member. I love all of you. I'm praying for you. Let me pray with you now. Father, thank you for the truth of this lesson. Thank you, Father, for being a holy, righteous God. And even when we don't understand the consequences you bring into our life, Lord, you are still worthy to bring yourself glory. We do pray that everything that happens in our life, you will arrange it sovereignly by your, by your divine hand, by your sovereign hand hand of providence, to bring it to pass in a way that will honor you in the greatest way possible. We love you. Thank you for your patience with us. Thank you for allowing us to repent. Thank you for giving us grace. And Lord, even when consequences come into our lives, you still are a loving, gracious God because you have not dealt with us after our sins or after the form of our iniquity. Thank you for that. We love you for it. We praise you and we honor you today. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Thank you. I'll be back perhaps this week with another with announcements, if there are any, and um, probably on, on phone uh, messages. But again, I love you. If you need anything, let us know. Uh, we're here for you, and God bless you until we meet again.